Okay, so let's uh, let's just get started. So uh, question number one. Uh, dear Ajahn, would these two be connected? Uh, anatta Sanya and Kaya Anatta. Um, Kaya Anatta, mind and ideas are not self. Uh, Kaya Pasadi. Uh, so, um, okay, so what you're asking is uh, whether seeing the body as non-self is related to Kaya Pasadi, uh, something like that, uh, yeah. Um, I think so. I think that's an in interesting question because uh, if you see the body as non-self, it means that you are less concerned about it. It's easy to let go, yeah, because you don't really worry about the body so much. Uh, and if you let the body go, uh, you don't means you're not attached to it, you don't hold on to it. Uh, it means that the whole process of meditation happens much more easily. Uh, yeah. So I think that is probably probably uh, connected. Uh, uh, and the deeper your anatta sanya is, uh, and especially if it starts not just the body as such, but you know the body and the five senses, uh, then I think it becomes quite strong. Yeah, because this is the main hindrance to entering deep meditation: the five hindrances, and then of course the the five external senses are the main problem, basically, in this particular case. Uh, so I would say yes. Uh, so if you can develop that perception of non-self in the five senses, uh, I what how the way I explained them before was more in the sense of as they disappear, you can see the non-self quality in them. And that's true. You can see that as they disappear through the process of meditation. But you can also see it more in uh, ordinary life that, you know, the five senses are, there's all this input that sometimes we don't want, uh, and we are just limited to how much control we have over them. Uh, and so you can see it to some extent there as well. Uh, so all of these things will be helpful uh, in the uh, Kaya Pasadi, which is the, uh, you know, an important part of the meditation process. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, so uh, there's all these kind of interesting connections, and that's uh, a connection. I think you're the first person to ever mention this connection before, never heard of it before, but so that's um, an interesting point. Uh, so thank you for that. Let's go to, on to the on to the next one. Um, dear Ajahn, also if I don't answer your question properly or whatever, you're very well, welcome to grab the microphone from Niwan and just uh, ask a follow up if you wish. Dear Ajahn, when we meditate, we are advised to observe our mind. Who is actually observing the mind? <laughs> Who is Mara? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so first of all, when you meditate, what you observe will depend on the situation. Yeah, some people might say that you should observe the mind, but uh, in uh, when you do mindfulness of breathing, you should ideally observe the breath uh, rather than the mind. Uh, yeah, so you become a breath observer. Uh, so who is observing the breath? Uh? Um, I think the kind of the question, the who, is the wrong question, right? Uh, the who is not really who, it's the what is observing the breath. Uh, and the what is observing the breath is, of course, the consciousness or the mind itself, yeah, which is the consciousness and all these mental factors coming together. Yeah? But if you are aware of the mind, it sounds like self-contradictory. How can you be aware? How can the mind be aware of itself? But that's actually exactly what's happening. Yeah? The mind is aware of itself. Yeah? And the way it works is that, for example, you have a, you have a defilement in the mind, uh, and then just after the defilement is there, that is when the mind knows the defilement was there. First of all, you see the defilement. Uh, yeah, that's what the mind does. If it is present in the mind, you have to see it because it's in your mind, unless you are distracted or whatever. And then the next thing is, oh, I have, the defilement is there. That's when you come to the knowing comes. The knowing is after, oh, always secondary. It comes after the fact. Uh, yeah, so there's always a temporal sequence, a sequence in time. Yeah, one thing happening after the other. Uh, so when you have insight or insight meditation, uh, insight meditation does not actually mean observing phenomena as they are. It always means observing phenomena after they happen. Uh, it's always after they happen. It's impossible to observe something immediately. Knowledge comes after perception. You perceive, then you know afterwards. Potapada uh, Sutta, Viganakaya 9. Perception comes first, knowledge comes afterwards. Yeah, Jnana afterwards. Uh, and so sometimes it's, this is one of those very interesting little things about the theory of meditation practice, uh, is that um, uh, some people will say, well, how can you, uh, how can jhana experience, how can you um, 
contemplate that if jhana you are completely immersed in the experience you can't contemplate it because you are completely locked into the experience yeah so you can't contemplate it so that means that it kind of doesn't work no but the point is you go to the jhana then you come out afterwards then you contemplate it and then they will say well but i mean contemplation vipassana is supposed to happen while it is while you are in it, yeah, that's kind of you are seeing the mind as the defilements are there. It happens as a process, ongoing process, but not really. All knowledge happens afterwards. So also, if you do, you know, just observing the mind as a um, on a continuous basis, the knowledge always happens afterwards. It's exactly the same thing. You enter the jhana, the knowledge comes afterwards. You contemplate afterwards. So contemplation is always afterwards. Knowledge is always secondary. Yeah? And so. Um, uh, yeah, not sure if that made any sense to you, but uh, it's true anyway. <laughs> okay, so there you are. So putting that to one side and going on to the next one. I'm trying to get slightly different handwritings. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. You mentioned that any obstacle, challenge, etc. that happens should not be personalized. I find this difficult to comprehend because those obstacles happen does not happen randomly. Uh, pl uh, plenty, of plenty of coincidences. Uh, co yeah, or, mm -hmm. For example, yesterday I had planned to bring my 80-year-old mum to attend your talk. However, she tripped and fell and and knocked her head at, on the wall. Wow, that's bad news. She's okay, still under observation. The head has a bump. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's a shame. So anyway, as such, I was in a dilemma to attend Adjan's talk or to stay back and observe her condition. And I chose to stay back because I would be so selfish if, uh, uh, of me to do otherwise. So you see, Ajahn, whenever we choose to embark on this path, obstacles are bound to arise. <laughs> That's why it feels personal. Um, I feel every individual has a different set of tests, which makes it even difficult to see that uh, all happenings are nature as it is. Thanks. I appreciate there are recordings. However, it's diff different when we are physically present. Yeah. First of all, I will say that well done for staying back to look after your mama. You did the, definitely the right thing because uh, this is a path of practice much more than a path just of listening. Yeah? And so doing the right thing is much more important than listening to the Dhamma. And you did the right thing. You look after your mom. So congratulations. That is how you're going to grow. If we don't do the right thing, first and foremost, we're never going to grow in the Dhamma. That is the most important thing. Yeah? yeah. So even if you don't come to a single of my talk, even if this talk is empty and I have to talk just to the camera, that is okay. <laughs> So we have to practice first and foremost. It's, this is really important. So absolutely what you said did is the right thing. So, but this is not personal. This is not what I meant by it is not personal, right? Uh, of course, everyone has personal challenges. Of course, our kamma for every person is going to be different. Absolutely. Uh, but that is not really what I was talking about. Uh, what I was talking about was uh, when other people are, are in our presence. Yeah. And we feel that they are attacking us. They are attacking me. In that case, it is not personal. They are not actually attacking you. They are reacting to their own internal cause and conditions. That's why they get upset. Yeah? Some people will never get upset with you. Other people will get upset with you a lot. And the reason is because they have internal conditions that make them upset. In that case, you should not take it personally. Because really the problem is with that person. That is what I was trying to say here. Yeah, and that is kind of a, I think, a very important point because if you're able to get that, uh, you really, it really undermines the idea of anger a lot. How can you get angry with someone who is suffering? Yeah, a person who does bad things, uh, they have a problem, right? They are suffering. They are doing things that will cause them all kind of disharmony with people around them. Uh, they are angry with others that do bad things. Uh, what can you, how can you not have compassion with them? Yeah, and if someone gets angry with me, uh, I'm a good person, right? Why are you getting angry with me for? I'm angry. The problem is yours, mate. <laughs> yeah. 
that's what I that's what I would think. Yeah, I know. You know, I I feel like I'm a reasonably wholesome person, and so are most of you. You're all good people. Uh, sometimes the reason we get angry back is because we doubt our own integrity, we doubt our own purity, uh, and so we kind of think, oh, maybe they're right. That's why we get angry. Yeah. <laughs> But Ajahn Brahm would never get angry with you. Ajahn Brahm would never do anything bad towards you. And that is the test, right? What would the enlightened person do? And if the enlightened person tells you you're all right, you're doing well, who cares what some scallywag says? Yeah, it's irrelevant what some scallywag says. So don't get upset. Don't allow other people to upset you just because they do bad things or because they say bad things or whatever. It's kind of irrelevant what most people think in this world. Most people haven't got a clue. Yeah, they really haven't got a clue. They just go through life and they, the defilements fly all over the place and they come out of them and it kind of hurts other people. They don't know what they're doing. Don't worry about other people. That is my point. Yeah, don't think that it is about you when other people do bad things to you. It's got nothing to do with you. It has to do with them. Sure, other things are more personal in the sense that it is your karma. In that sense, it is more personal. That is true. So you're quite right about that too. Okay, anyway, let's move on to the next one here. Okay, Sukihotu Ajahn. I realized after attending your sessions for three days. <laughs> Similar handwriting. Okay, well, just. Uh, <laughs> anyway, you're getting a good deal, getting a good deal tonight. <laughs> Uh, for three days, <clears throat> these following words are still foreign to me. Cultivation and meditation. Also due to many different interpretations, instructions, I am so confused. Appreciate if Ajahn can break it down to bite size. <laughs> uh, where I can share and practice together with my children. Uh, thank you. I hope to use Ajahn's guidance daily with my children as we embark on this treacherous and uncharted journey of teens, puberty, and raging hormones. They are 13 and 14 years old. Yes, that is always a challenging age, so I, will, I wish you luck. <laughs> so, um, okay, so cultivation and meditation are, sometimes they are the same thing, sometimes slightly different things, yeah? Remember that the we are, what we are dealing with really is Pali words. And uh, Pali words, when they are translated, it can be misleading. So sometimes it's easier to use the Pali words. And the usual Pali words that we're talking about is bhavana. Bhavana, of, <coughs> often translated as meditation. Uh, but bhavana really means to make, so <coughs> make something exist. That's what it means. <coughs> To develop is kind of the meaning of bhavana. So that is the, that was what bhavana means, to, to develop. Yeah? So you, in other words, to develop means you haven't got something and you make it come into being. So for example, when we talk about develop, when we talk about the perception of impermanence, it says in the Sutta we should bhaveti it. Bhaveti means we should develop it. Developing means that it becomes more strong in your mind becomes more clear. That's what it means. So as you use this contemplation, as you think about the impermanence of the world, after a while it starts to bite. Yeah, it starts to work. It starts to feel like something. Yes, now I understand what it means. Yeah, things are changing. Nothing is stable. Nothing is reliable. People get sick. You get old. You die. The world buildings are crumbling. The government doesn't work properly. The government is falling apart. Yeah, the... Um, uh, the, the climate change, whatever it is, everything is always moving and changing. And this is kind of the idea of impermanence. After a while, you start to get it and you start to understand you cannot hold on to things in the world. You have to hold on to things on the spiritual path. So that is the basic idea of uh, meditate, cultivation, maybe, yeah? or meditation, depending on which word you use. Uh, cultivation, there's another word used in Pali, which is very similar to the idea of bhavana. That is bahulikaroti. Bahulikara or balikaroti means to make much of. Yeah? Bahu, bahu is much. Bahuli or bahu is much. Karoti is to make. So you make much of something. In other words, you cultivate it. Yeah? You keep on doing it. This is kind of cultivation. Making much means you do it often. You do it frequently. You do it in different ways. You try to make it come about. Yeah? Bhavana and uh, so meditation and cultivation. 
usually in English language, meditation is usually a little, little bit more narrow. Usually when we talk about meditation in English language, usually we mean like watching the breath, yeah, sitting down cross-legged, having a particular thing that you are doing. Yeah? Whereas things like bhavana and bahulikaroti can mean can be very broad. They can be things you do in daily life. They can be how you develop your mind by thinking in certain ways. So meditation tends to be a bit more narrow. And I would use the word meditation only when you sit down, close your eyes, and you watch your breath, and you, or you do metta meditation or something like that. I would limit it to that. When you're washing, your, washing the dishes, you're not meditating. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we have this idea, yeah, meditating all the time, okay, washing dishes, washing dishes. Uh, but um, I, I don't call that meditation. I call that uh, washing dishes. So. <laughs> all right. Okay, so good luck to you and your children and see, see what happens. Uh, don't try to get your children to meditate, don't try too hard, because sometimes if you try too hard to get your children to meditate or whatever, you have even more dukkha in your life. Uh, so uh, I, I was reading just a very interesting article, actually, just the other day. I, I like to read articles about you know, research in areas of happiness and these kind of things. Uh, this was a very interesting article there. And uh, this was uh, a fellow who is like a happiness researcher. Uh, and he's a professor at some university. Now, apparently, he's retired. But now he just writes articles for newspapers and things. Uh, and he said that, uh, you know, very often when we have children, we want to, uh, you know, we want to kind of make our children into good people, right? Uh, every parent wants to have children who are good people, upright, and maybe they study hard and all of these kind of things. Uh, and then he made the point that even though we want that, uh, our influence on our children is actually very limited. Yeah, you try your very best, and still they turn out to be dodgy, or you don't, or, <laughs> or, or you don't try at all, and they turn out to be really good people. Right? It's kind of the reverse. It's kind of really weird. So it's very, very uncertain. And so he said that instead of trying to make our people into good students, instead of trying to make our people, in, our children, into good Buddhists, yeah. A kind of mini, mini, me, mini, kind of mini Ajahn Brahm, maybe I don't know what it is that you want your, your child to be. Yeah. Instead of trying these kind of things, he said that the one thing that we know works uh, is that we can make our children happy by loving them. Uh, that is the one thing that actually works. Uh, so the most important thing any parent should do is not try to make your child into a Buddhist or try to make them into having straight A's at school. Forget about that. Yeah, they will get those A's you know, in one way or another, or they won't get them in one way or another, but usually nothing to do with you. Just love them. And if you love your children, yeah, regardless of how naughty they are, regardless of how bad they are, then they will turn out to be usually very good people. They will be well-adjusted in the world because they feel a sense of self-worth and self-value. Yeah, and usually you end up having a really good relationship with them for the rest of your life because you have shown that you love them regardless of what they are like, regardless of the difficulties they go through. And if they, you know, if they become really difficult to deal with, you can always say to them, I love you regardless. Yeah. Why? Because you're my son and daughter. And so I think this is the most important job of any parent. Yeah. Always show love and affection to your children. That will, they will take with them in the rest of their life. And this will be the most important kind of baggage, if you like, or the most important influence they have from their parents. This is a beautiful idea. It doesn't matter so much what people become in this world. Yeah? It doesn't matter if they become a monk or a nun or a, they are, remember a layperson. It doesn't matter if they become the garbage collector or the managing director. Yeah? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that they're happy. Yeah? What matters is that they're well-adjusted. Yeah? What matters is that they have a good life. Yeah? And we should not. I mean, one of the biggest dangers of being a parent uh, is the idea that you take pride in your child. You want to show the world that my child is great. And so you are reflected in your child. Uh, terrible, isn't it? Uh, it's a really bad idea. You should never worry about that. You should never think that your value increases because your child is brilliant at school. That's nonsense. That's a really dangerous thing. Uh, it means we manipulate and control our children. Uh, it doesn't matter what they are. Make them as happy as you can by loving them. That is the most important thing. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Next one. 
Nero Hajan, thank you so much for reminding us frequently of the importance of living well. This has helped in putting the right priorities in my life. Uh, is it possible to share with us how you live well in your typical daily life so that we can take a leaf out of your daily life? Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> um, so, so what do I, what is, uh, what do I try to, what, first of all, it's, you know, one of those things is always to kind of look for opportunities, yeah, to do the right thing, yeah. That is kind of one of those important things because the opportunities are always there, yeah. And it's not like waiting for the time to arise. You have to take the opportunities, uh, yeah, even if the right time doesn't arise. Uh. And whenever you open your mouth, in a sense, you have an opportunity to give a gift to other people. Uh. How do you speak to others? Uh, do you speak with, with affection, with care, with kindness? Uh. Do you speak in a way that goes to the heart of other people? Uh. Do you speak, use the four kinds of right speech? Uh. Do you say things that are meaningful and useful? Uh. Yeah. So every time you open your mouth, you have an opportunity to give a gift. So the idea of generosity is so much broader than just the giving of material things. By the way, I really appreciate the coffee, so don't get this wrong, yeah? <laughs> but it's more than just giving coffee, yeah? It is giving in so many different ways. And one of those gifts we can give is the gift of kind speech to other people. Huh? So this is one way of doing it. This is one way. Huh? The other way is that, uh, you know, when in my daily life, whenever I see a little bit of irritation arising or something like that towards somebody, huh? I always ask myself, I always know this is my problem, not the problem of the other person. Huh? I never want to change the other person. I ask myself, what can I do to see the situation differently? Huh? I know the problem is in here, not out there. Huh? And so uh, I always change my perception. I remind myself of the good quality in the people around me. Huh? I live in the monastery. I live with really good people. Yeah. Not perfect people, but really good people. And so I try to focus on those good qualities. Uh, and when I come here, I do the same thing. Yeah? When I see you, it makes me really happy. I'm together with good fellow Buddhists, uh, with people who are Kalyanamitas, uh, people who are doing their very best. Uh, and that is worthy of enormous respect. Uh, so it's wonderful to be with that sort of people. Uh, and so this is the other thing I do. Yeah? Trying to always see the good in others, uh, never allowing the negative qualities of mind to kind of take over. Uh, and then I try to also be generous whenever I can. I try not to be too trapped by hierarchy. Hierarchy can be very destructive because when you live in a hierarchy, you kind of can be sometimes you feel entitled. Yeah. You feel I am entitled to these things. These people should give to me. I should not give anything back or whatever. And so you in the monastery, you sit there and you think, oh, the Juni monks, they should wash my bowl. I shouldn't wash their bowl. Yeah, that's kind of how you sometimes the hierarchy in the monastery is. So why shouldn't you, as a senior monk, wash the bowl of a more junior monk? Yeah. And sometimes I do that. Sometimes the junior monk comes and takes my bowl, and then I take the bowl of the junior monk afterwards. Yeah. And that's really nice when that happens. Yeah, and that's really, really beautiful because it kind of, uh, we should help each other. It creates more a sense of harmony, of brotherhood, of working together instead of having these hierarchies. Hierarchies are very destructive uh, because they stop you sometimes from doing kindness when you could do something kind. Uh, so it's all of these kind of things. Yeah, this is kind of how you, so you take the opportunity. You always ask yourself, what is the opportunity right now to do something kind? And it can be very, very small things. Uh, yeah, tiny little things in daily life that do this. Uh. So, uh, yeah, so this is kind of very down to earth practical advice, yeah, not too highfalutin about meditation or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's go on to the next one here. Dean Ajahn, may I know what is the difference in message between the sutta on the lump of form, the uh, Pena Pindupama Sutta and the Sutta uh, on the All, the Sabba Sutta. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, the Sutta on the All. You mean the six sense spaces are the All? Is that what you mean? Huh? Sutta on the All, Sabba Sutta. Sabba Sutta. Uh, it just says Sabba Sutta. Sabba Sutta. I don't think it's Sabasava Sutta on the All. I'm not sure exactly which Sutta you mean now. Let me just check if I can find the Sabba Sutta. 
23. What did you say? Uh, what? 35, 23. Uh, who asked and this question? Can you clarify the name? It's easier. SN3523 here. Yeah. Sabba, the Sabba Sutta. Yeah, I know. I think I know what Sutta it is then. Uh, 25, 25, 33? 20, 23. Uh. All. Ah, Sabba Sutta. There you are. That's what it's exactly. Okay. So the all. That's a very short Sutta. It's very handy. Thank you for choosing such a short Sutta. <laughs> so uh, we hear, this is the Sutta, right? So you can maybe all see it there. You can all see the Sutta on the all. <laughs> At Savati Mendicants, I will teach you the all. Listen, what is the all? It's just the eye and sights, the ear and sounds, the nose and smells, the tongue and taste, the body and touches, and the mind and ideas. This is called the alls. Mendicants, upon someone was to say, I will reject this all and describe another all. They would have no grounds for that, and they would be stumped by questions. And in addition, they would get frustrated. Why is that? Because they're out of their element. <laughs> So this is the all, yeah, the Sabha Sutta. So uh, the Sabha Sutta, the all here seems to mean that there is nothing outside of this. Uh, so the moment you account for everything, for you know, the six senses and all the objects of the six senses, uh, you have accounted for everything that exists. Uh, there is nothing beyond that. Uh, yeah? And that's kind of nice, yeah? That's everything. So... Uh, uh, the, when it comes to the five khandas, the uh, 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 penupinda, I'm kind of getting the, that's mixed up, the penapindu pama sutta is about the five aggregates. So the five aggregates are slightly different from the six sense bases. The five aggregates is more like a, a, a um, useful division of the personality, so, so for contemplation purposes. So you divide it into these things because these are important areas we need to contemplate, especially like the will. And the body should be contemplated. Feelings need to be contemplated. Yeah, These are clear areas that require contemplation. Yeah? So the five khandas are not necessarily the all, not necessarily meant as a completely encompassing everything. Yeah? Whereas the six sense spaces and the six senses are meant to compass everything. Yeah? So what that means is that if you, what it means is just that there is nothing apart from the six sense space, that's really all it means. Uh, yeah, you have, you have accounted for everything. So if you want to see everything as non-self or everything as dukkha, everything as, uh, as anicca impermanent, uh, you, then you have included everything into that contemplation if you contemplate the six sense spaces. Uh. The alternative is the five aggregates that will also effectively be everything because everything that matters is included in them, but uh, it is a slightly different way of thinking about it. Uh. So I'm not sure if that was your question entirely, but um, maybe good enough. So I'm not sure what else to say about it. So it has to be good enough, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, if you want to uh, bring it up again, try again, please feel free to do so. <coughs> okay, Bhante, I wonder how should one practice Buddhism correctly? This is a very good question, and uh, we, are this, we should be able to answer it. I think, bringing up this blank screen now. Uh, should one strive towards eliminating self, anatta, desire and greed, and be disinterested in the worldly things and affairs? Won't this lead to no drive and motivation in seeking a job, in making money, and be productive force in the society? The lack of desire will also mean no interest in buying and acquiring stuff, which means no business in the deteriorating economy here. Oh. <laughs> this would ultimately cause the society to collapse, won't it? <laughs> so instead of encouraging people to let go of the desire, focus on anatta, anicca, and walking, gra walking the ground blissfully enchanting om, won't it be better for them to focus on metta karuna and helping the less fortunate beings like... Uh, uh, what the Tai Chi Buddhists are doing. Uh, the pursuit of arahantship can be left to the next lives. <laughs> Ooh, so you want to become a Tai Chi Buddhist. Uh, that's, <laughs> okay. Um, so 
I, I would say to this question that um, um, this is not likely to happen, right? Uh, this is not what happens usually. Uh, and so uh, society will not collapse just because you start contemplating anatta. The Buddha, Buddhist teaching has been taught for two and a half thousand years. Many, many people have been contemplating anatta. We are still here. Uh, yeah? <laughs> so it's, it's not going to happen uh. So, but, but remember what matters in your life, yeah? So you have to do what works in your life. And in your life, what is most likely to matter is precisely what you say. Contemplate compassion, have metta, have kindness. These are the most important things. One of the reasons I'm talking about so many things is because all of these things can be helpful in practice. But often it is helpful if you go a little bit further, especially if you become a good meditator, these more advanced contemplations can be very useful. But if you have doubts, yeah, and if you don't really understand it properly, and you can't see how it integrates, don't do it. Do metta, do karuna. This is far more important. Yeah, far more important. Be kind, be compassionate, be caring. This is what really matters. And if you can do that, then see what happens with your mind. Then your meditation might deepen. Maybe then you can do a little bit of non-self perception, yeah? Maybe then it will be helpful there. Yeah? But I can almost guarantee you that you're not going to lose interest in everything, yeah? Almost guarantee that. Uh, because that is, uh, you know, becoming an arahant is not really, it's not going to happen to all that many people, yeah? Unfortunately, it would be good if it happened to more people. So if you can do it, please do it. Uh, that's what I say here. Yeah? Because uh, arahants in the world, first of all, very few and far between, uh, and they are a beacon in the world. They are a light in the world that show the way. If you just see an arahant, that is a very, very powerful thing. Because what you are seeing, you're seeing the possibility of something extraordinary. An arahant is someone with incredibly good qualities, with so much kindness, with so much care, who are so peaceful. They are unflappable in the most difficult situations. So when you see that, you actually what you are seeing, you're seeing the Dhamma in action. That is incredibly, incredibly useful. So we need more arahants in the world, not less. So if you think you have the potential, go for it. Yeah, don't hold back. Don't uh, do other silly things with your life. <laughs> That's what I would say. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, you are not going. So, so this, you know. So I think you are being worried about something that is not not really worth. You no, know, you don't need to be worried about these things. It is not just not going to happen, basically. Yeah. And I often hear this question, people say, oh, you know, if everyone were to become a monk, you know, the world would collapse, so is, maybe I shouldn't become a monk. That is, again, the wrong way of thinking, yeah? Not everyone is going to become a monk. It's not going to happen anyway. don't have to worry about that. Uh, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I think lack of desire, yeah? So what does it mean to be, have a lack of desire? I, you know, so much of the desire in the world is actually dangerous, you know. Yes, it causes you to buy and it causes you to, maybe the economy keeps going. But actually, maybe it's good if the economy doesn't work quite so well, yeah. We are destroying the planet through economic growth. Yeah, it's kind of really problematic sometimes, economic growth. It kind of causes all kinds of issues. So this is not kind of simple things. So sometimes a bit less desire can be good, yeah. I know that economists kind of say that you have to buy more to be, but we're just buying junk anyway. It kind of seems kind of crazy. Buy more junk to keep the economy going. For what reason? I, sometimes I don't get what's going on. It's kind of, I find it all very weird, to be honest, uh, sometimes. Uh, I don't think our economic models are all that useful sometimes. They're kind of weird. Uh, anyway, I have no idea. I'm just kind of ranting off some, <laughs> some stuff. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Dear Ajahn Brahmali, what happens if the children of their late father discover that he had a mistress that he kept secret, uh, etc.? I have already spoken to this person in person, so I think we have already sorted that out. So I will leave that one to one side. Next question. Dear Ajahn, I feel more confused after these two days of Sutta retreat. This is the same question we had the other day, isn't it? <laughs> if this world cannot bring us happiness, then what do I do while I am in this world? For the past two years, I have been feeling stressed and tried because the work has been so tiring and busy. I've been chased by deadlines long, yet I cannot... Yeah, so this is already... We already discussed this one, yeah. Yeah, so this is the questions have been put back in again. Huh? So now this is going to be interesting to 
figure out what is going on here. Uh, this has also been talked about before. Uh, this, these are all the old questions, I think. Uh, uh, Yeah, this has also been done before. Uh, so um, I think we may, maybe we have come to the end already. Ajahn, uh, uh, yeah, this one has been done. Uh, this has been done. Uh, and uh, what about this one here? Yeah. It was, yeah, it was left, left in the bottom. So, yeah. Okay, that makes things easier. Usually, I tend to make longer answers if there are a few questions and shorter if there are many. So, this today I kind of misjudged things because I thought there were more questions. So, that's kind of uh, the only downside. But this one here, maybe. I'm not sure this one has been answered already. Okay. Okay. So, okay. If you are in a in a desert with some water, uh, yeah. So you ha you have some water. You are in a desert. So you there's just sand and dryness everywhere around you. And you meet two people in that desert. This is like a this is like a, I'm going to be tested now by this person. <laughs> so you meet two people. One of them is close to attaining nibbana. He needs some water to cross that last line to attain nibbana. Another one is dying of thirst. Yeah, who would you give the water to, and why? <laughs> so, um, okay, I think the answer is. Uh, so this depends on your personality. Yeah, there is no right answer to this kind of question. So what you should do is you should follow your heart. What does your heart say? And you should not follow greed. Yeah? If you follow, for example, think, yeah, this person get enlightened, that means I have a chance to get enlightened too. So I'm going to give it to him. I can care about the other person. If you think like that, it's bad. Yeah? Because you're coming from a sense of greed, a sense of not caring about others. That's always bad. Yeah? Or you, uh, so, that, so you should follow your conscience. What does your mind say? And your mind may feel just have this incredibly compassion for the man who is dying of thirst. Yeah. And you think that, well, the person who is enlightened, they will look after them. They will probably become enlightened later anyway. So it doesn't really matter. I'm going to save the person who is dying of thirst. And so you follow your heart and you do that. Or you might think, well, actually, the fellow who is dying of thirst, yeah, he's done good karma. He will have a good rebirth anyway. Much more important to give the fellow who is getting enlightened a chance. Yeah. And then he can help others. So either one is correct. Either one would be okay, depending on your, pers on your perspective, uh, on what your heart is telling you. Uh, what is important is not to is follow the good intentions, the good motivation. Uh, and if you're following that, then you can never go wrong in this kind of situation. Uh, these things are really unanswerable purely on a logical grounds. Uh, but once you are in that situation, often you will know what, what to do. And it will just happen automatically. Uh. So... That is my reply. Please. <laughs> Would he just keep quiet? <laughs> he might do. Yeah, I, I don't know what the Buddha would have said. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? What would he have said? Was the Buddha tested in that particular way ever? Um, yeah, not sure. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what the Buddha would have said. It's interesting because one of the kind of one of the nice things in the suttas, which I kind of always I took away, what was fascinating. Very often in Buddhism, we talk about where is the most merit, right? Uh, so we we kind of I, uh, someone once joked I was here in Malaysia before, and they said to me, "Oh, here in Malaysia that we have this kind of spreadsheet, and we kind of we calculate in the most maximum merit." Yeah, so we had this kind of this really kind of. Uh, rational way of producing maximum merit. I have so much income if I give here, give there. You have a kind of a sort of all out. And they were kind of having a joke on their own, at their own expense yeah, because of that. And because if you think like that, it is too cold. Yeah? It's kind of this cold idea of making merit. But mer make, making merit of doing something should be a joyful activity. Yeah? That is when it's really powerful. Yeah? And, I, and there's this very nice sutta which talks about this. It's a sutta I have talked about here before, but I can mention again. And this is a sutta where uh, King 
Pasenadi, I think, goes to the Buddha. And King Pasenadi, he asks the Buddha, where should a gift be given her? Where should a gift be given her? Yeah, it's a very interesting question there. And then the Buddha replies. He says, first of all, he says that there are two different questions here, he says. One question is, where is the most merit? And the other one is, where should a gift be given? In other words, a gift should not necessarily be given where there is most merit. Yeah, these are two separate questions. And the place where it is most merit, well, that will be, you know, where someone, like if you give it to the Sangha headed by the Buddha, and then you give it an Arahant, you have this kind of hierarchy and, and these kind of things. But that is not necessarily where, where a gift should be given. The question should be given, he says, where your mind is pasidati. Pasidati means your mind becomes kind of peaceful and inspired and um, motivated to give. Yeah, you feel really joyful about the act. Uh, that is kind of, to me, really interesting. So why does the Buddha say that? Uh, and I think the answer is very simply that when you give and you do it joyfully, uh, you're learning about the power of generosity. You will do it again in the future. Uh, you're building up this understanding of what generosity really is about. Uh, but if you give in a calculating way, yeah, your mind is going to be dry, it's going to be uninterested, it's not really going to be very powerful at all. Uh, so maybe it will give good results on that particular occasion, uh, but in the long run, it will not really have any great effect. Uh, that is one side of the answer. Another side of the answer is that if you give where you feel inspired, uh, the very fact that you feel more joy and more mindfulness when you give means that actually there is more merit there anyway. Because joy is another factor. Mindfulness is another factor in the amount of merit that is incurred. Yeah, Because it is more powerful impact on you when you have more mindfulness and joy. So actually the... The, uh, just seeing someone as an arahant is not enough to calculate the merit. Merit depends on all of these other factors coming together as well. Huh? And so feel inspired. Yeah? When do you feel inspired to give? Huh? Such a beautiful idea. So when you feel inspired, then for goodness sake give. And it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if it is a Muslim on the street. It doesn't matter if it is someone who you, or, you know, ordinarily you would think has, doesn't deserve any gift. But if you feel that urge, wow, you feel compassion, Give. That is the time to give. Why? Because you feel inspired. And then it will have a powerful impact on you. And uh, so uh, I always found that to be a very uh, interesting perspective and different from what very often you will hear in Buddhist circles. So. We ha still have a few minutes left if anyone wishes to ask uh, more questions. Uh, please Fire away. I shouldn't say fire away anymore. Please, um, <laughs> please go for it. Um, uh, perhaps Ajahn, uh, he, Ajahn Brahm did say that uh, when we say going to the wilderness, uh, and what he means is going to a very secluded place or quiet place away from everybody, and he suggested that in modern living, we, we go to a high-rise building of 20 stories high and soundproof room and and kind of you know, being away from the the usual world. Yeah. You did, did recommend that as the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Niwen, for being being the practical person here who <laughs> always asks. No, that's, that's really nice, actually, that you kind of bring it back to reality. Because I think one of the dangers of being a monk is that you have lived so far out of society for so long. You don't really, sometimes you can't relate properly to what people are, you know, their lives uh, so I'm really grateful for you for actually bringing it back to reality again. So that's, that's great. So what, what I would say is that, um, first of all, it is often good to get a little bit away from your home environment, yeah? Uh, because uh, when you are surrounded by your house and by your family and things, uh, all of these things, all that familiarity can be confining in a certain way. Uh, and I know that people often meditate better even just by getting away from that and going to a place like coming here, or going to Wisdom Park, or, or whatever it takes, or coming to Jana Grove, or whatever, you get a little out, outside of your ordinary environment. That is already helpful, huh? because it detaches the mind a little bit from all of those attachments that we have around us. Uh, so that is one way of doing it. Uh, another way is, of course, to come and stay in the monastery for a while. Yeah, Come and chill at uh, Bodhinyana Monastery yeah, for a few weeks. That's always a nice thing to do. Even if you are a family father, yeah, you can still do that occasionally. <laughs> No, that's not a hint. It's just a just a uh, possibility. <laughs> and 
then even in your house, even in your apartment or wherever you are, it's good to have like a place where you do your meditation, right? Uh, so you, it's like you have a sacred place within your apartment. Uh, like it doesn't even have to be a whole, you may not have an extra room. If you have got an extra room, you have a corner in the room, yeah? A separate area. This is my sacred spot. Uh, and after a while, it kind of builds up a certain energy because you, that's where you always meditate. You don't do anything but meditation in that area. That is where you kind of do your thing here. Yeah? And it builds up a certain energy here. Yeah? And that's kind of really nice. Yeah? And uh, <clears throat> one of the things you notice is that certain places in the world, when you go to them, you can feel the energy straight away. Yeah? You know that this is a place where many good things have happened over a long period of time. Yeah? And you can feel the juju yeah, in that place. Yeah? Yeah? Powerful juju. Yeah? And one of those places is the meditation hall at Bodhinyana Monastery. Yeah, you go inside and it's like, wow, this place is actually special. It has a certain power to it. Uh, and then when you sit down, you close your eyes, it kind of helps you in meditation. Uh, and you can build up a similar kind of thing in your, in your house yeah, over time by hanging out, by doing the same thing, same good thing in that particular place over, over a long period of time. Uh. And so these are some of the, uh, some of the kind of tricks, yeah, over, uh, yeah. So, um, mm. please, why well, yeah, no. yeah. Um, sir, you, sir, you mentioned um, meditation hall, but mm -hmm. that's neither Sunya Garo or anything like that. You're not secluded. Yeah, that's true. So, um, so that really depends on your, uh, uh, depends on the level of your meditation. Yeah. So uh, uh, you go to a sunyagara usually when your meditation is becoming quite powerful and strong, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So in the meantime, it can be nice to have that support of a of a meditation hall or a place which has spiritual qualities. So, yeah, yeah. Should I? Well, you want. Talking about that, <laughs> washing the dishes is not meditation. Mm. Well, we don't call that either, but it's just kind of paying attention mm. to what you're doing at the time. Mm. You know, it could be sweeping the floor, walking, anything, you know, mm. those kind of things. But we don't, they don't call it meditation. Yeah. Just paying attention yeah. at the moment, yeah. what we, you're doing, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, it's interesting because sometimes you go to various uh, Buddhist centers and they, you know, they always say things like, oh, you should eat mindfully and all of these kind of things uh, because you should be mindful kind of with everything you do. And um, I, I think that's, it's okay to be mindful, of course, uh, but we should also be clear about the purpose of that mindfulness. Uh, and I think that is often the problem because people end up being mindful, but they do not really know how to use it properly. Okay, I'm mindful, now what? Yeah. And uh, so I think it's very important that we emphasize the point that, well, the reason you are mindful in all those situations, whether it's washing the dishes or sweeping the floor or talking to people or listening or whatever it is, the reason is really so you can keep a pure mind. That's the purpose. So you are aware of how you react to these things, yeah? What is your mind state like? And then when you see some kind of negative thing coming up, then you can deal with it. Or you can develop good qualities while you're doing it. I'm, I'm wash, washing the dishes. Hooray, I'm helping out, yeah? I'm doing something good for whatever, maybe doing something good for the BGF or whatever when I'm washing the dishes. And then they, you can actually use it as a development of your sila and your morality. And then it becomes really powerful, huh? But just being mindful for the sake of mindfulness, uh, the pursuit does not really talk about that. Uh, and this is kind of almost like a later development. It is not about being mindful. If you look at the very famous, uh, 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 the very famous um, paragraph or passage in the suttas on the Sati Sampajanya, yeah, this is kind of the, the critical one and the important one for all of these things. Uh, because Sati Sampajanya passage says that you should be Sampajana Kari, you should make clear, you should make sampajanya, you should have sampajanya, you should have it when you walk out, when you return, when you look aside, when you look to the other side, when you put out your bowl, yeah, to receive alms food, when you take it back, when you go to the toilet, when you eat, when you talk, when you sleep, all of these kind of things, yeah, so in other words, that passage 
for monastics means all the time in your life outside of your formal meditation practice. That's really what it is referring to, yeah? When you go into village for arms, all these kind of things. Uh, and if you read that passage, uh, the uh, meaning seems to be yeah, it, that it is not that you are mindful while doing them, uh, but that you are mindful and you have clear comprehension of awareness about them. And full awareness about them means that you understand how to do these things. Yeah. So, for example, it says that you should have a clear comprehension, not in sleep, but about sleep. In other words, how much should I sleep? What is the right kind of bed? What is the right way of sleeping? Should I be the lying posture? Should it be something else? Yeah, these kind of things. Eating, does it mean mindful while eating? No, I don't think it means that. It means mindful about eating. What kind of food is suitable for me? How much should I eat? Not to eat too little, finding the middle way. Yeah? And once you think of it in that way, then even that particular passage is not about mindfulness in all the things you do. It's about having clear awareness about those things. So you do them in an appropriate way. You speak the right amount. You speak what is purposeful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is my understanding. And if you look at the sutta, I think there are some very, very good grounds for thinking that that actually is the correct way of saying it. Hmm. Looking at it, in, instead of you know having scatter mind, getting mad at you know if you ha had a, yeah. if you are angry with someone, you know you are in your in your mind you're still getting mad at at that person. Yeah. But while you are doing the dishes, you're not paying attention to what you're doing, but you, your mind is scatter. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. you know, getting yeah. mad at whatever it yeah. is. So that's another way of looking at it, mm, you think? Mm, mm. Yeah, sure, that makes sense, yeah. So you don't allow your mind to kind of uh, do all kind of stupid things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, and sure. That's why they, yeah. that's what they were, were teaching and in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, no, that's fine, yep, yep. So group for one more? Yeah, please, yeah, there was only, we have got, we've got four and a half minutes left, so please. <laughs> I, I, I have a related question yeah. um, to what has been discussed because what you just said to what Aya's question, it just opens up my mind mm. because every time or maybe just my own limited understanding from um, teachers uh, sharing on other posture or daily activities, keep mindful is, yeah, eat mindfully. But then your explanation is like, open up seriously the, the whole world actually you know it's like yeah. wow you know I never thought of it that way yeah um the other thing is uh related to this uh when you mentioned that um ba, 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 is, the, yeah. is, is yeah. the true meditation is when you shut your eyes and then sitting meditation as we understand mm. it but many of the times, um, many of the meditation retreat uh, incorporated like half-half walking meditation. So, so I'm interested to know: is walking meditation the bhavana, or yeah. or or is yeah. this sati and sati sampajana? So, I yeah. just wonder whether you could explain. Uh, okay, Thanks. yeah, I think walking meditation can be considered bhavana as well. I think that would probably come under that. It is not talked about very much in the suttas. It's interesting. The suttas pretty much talk about sitting meditation all the time. It is sometimes it is said that the, the Buddha or the monks they do chankama. Chankama is the chankama is the word for walking meditation in the suttas. Chankama just means walking back and forth. That's really, really all it means. So if you go to uh, Thailand, they have what they call the, in Thailand, in Thailand they call it jogrongs, which basically is the same word. It's chankama. It's a Pali word. And it just means, it means, basically just means walking back and forth. And it doesn't say in the suttas what you're supposed to do. Yeah, it doesn't give any instructions. And so it is up to us to kind of make something out of it. And so those, you know, when you often you will hear instructions about feeling the feelings in your feet while you're walking, that is actually not found in the suttas. It is an interpretation, a modern interpretation of what walking meditation is about. So it means that you can do almost anything you like when you do walking meditation. If you do want to do metta, you can do that. If you want to feel the touch in your feet, you can do that. I remember many years ago, I had a conversation with Utejaniya. You know Utejaniya? 
quite a well-known Burmese monk, a very, very nice monk. And we had a discussion about these things. And he told me that what he does in walk meditation, he doesn't really do anything. He just walks back and forth and observes his mind. Yeah? And this is also nice. Yeah? You walk back and forth and you're just aware of what's happening in your mind. That you get to know yourself. You can clear out the bad thoughts and build up some good thoughts. Yeah? This is also another nice thing. So you don't have to be very limited in walking meditation. Do whatever it feels like. I would say that a lot of the time when we go on a meditation retreat, uh, we're already trying very hard to watch the breath while we're sitting, uh, already doing some samatha. You need to do something else when you're doing walking meditation, I reckon, yeah, instead of watching your feet again. So do some contemplation instead. Uh, do some death contemplation, impermanence, metta, um, some, think about the sutta you just heard, reflect on the talk you have heard, whatever it is. Uh, do something more active, uh, because the activity of the body lends itself to more activity in the mind. The tends to often can go together very easily. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, everyone happy? Yeah? <laughs> okay, good. That's wonderful. So that is all for today. So I wish you all a wonderful night, good night rest, and hope to see you again tomorrow morning. Yeah.